Hey everybody, welcome to Gateway Victory Church. This is our online broadcast. We're also meeting in person these days as well. Feel free to come and join us. Check out our website for information on that. Whether you're watching today with people around you or maybe all by yourself, why don't you go ahead and take a second and share it right from the platform that you're in and let us know that you're there uh, watching. And that would be great so we could engage with you. In the meantime, let's go ahead and pray. We're going to get started. We've got a great time of worship today, just inviting the presence of God and uh, an, an encounter with God is waiting for you on the other side of this. So let's get started. Let's join our hearts together and pray. Father, here we are right in the middle of a fantastic summer. God, we are just coming before you right now, joining our hearts with people that are watching in person as well as watching online, coming before you, Father, to experience your presence, to get to know you better, to draw our hearts closer to you. God, I thank you that when we touch you, we are changed. God, thank you that you are real and that you are powerful in our lives. And Father, those of us that know that, we pray for a greater encounter right now. Those that are just watching in today, God, we open Open up our hearts to you, for you to come and speak to us and to show yourself real to us right now. Father, we thank you for it and believe you for it today in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Amen. Praise God. We'll have fun. Let's go.
Let it break through the walls, beat down the doors, crash through the windows, and cover the earth, the earth, the earth. Let the spirit rise up, let it break through the walls, beat down the doors, crash through the windows, and cover the earth.
boys and girls, how are you today? We wanted to ask if you, any of you had questions about God that we could answer. And today, Mason has a question. So, Mason, what's your question? Hi, Corey. Hi, Rosie. My question about God is how big he is. That's a great question, Mason. Corey, do you think God is big? Well, my God is so big. So strong and so mighty. Well, yes, I think God is big. I think he's bigger than a mountain. He's bigger than an ocean. He's, he's, he's bigger than the biggest thing I can think of. Hey, kids, what's the biggest thing you can think of? The biggest thing I can think of um, is Goliath. Something really big as a mountain. Something that's really big is a tree. Something big is a house. The biggest thing I can think of is the Calgary Tower. The city. And the biggest tower in the world. The ocean's big and water's big. The biggest thing I can think of is the sun. I know that I can climb up most of the way up a mountain I a helicopter. The biggest thing is the sky. The ocean's really big. The two biggest things I can think of is the earth and heaven. That's a lot of big stuff, kids. Did you know God is bigger than all of that put together? The Bible says that God measured the heavens with his own measuring tape. Really? Hey, I used a measuring tape with my dad once. Hey, Spencer, could you show us how to use a measuring tape? This is how you measure it. 30 inches. That's great, Spencer. So if God used a measuring tape, how big do you think God is compared to all those stars and all the heavens? Yeah, wow, God must be bigger than them, doesn't he? Yeah, he sure is. And do you know he put each of the stars in each of the constellations? Do you know how far apart the stars are? Millions and billions of miles apart. Light years apart. You're right. Hey, Rosie, I remember that the Bible says, too, that we can't go anywhere away from God's presence just because he's so big. That's right, Corey. Psalm 139 says, where can I go from your presence? Even if I fly on the wings of the morning or go to the farthest parts of the sea, even there you are with me. God is so amazing, Rosie. But why is he so big? That's a good question, Corey. Hey kids, why is God so big? Because he builded the whole earth. Because he looks after us? Because... He holds the world in his palm. God needs to be big to face the devil. And to build heaven for everyone. Well, because he made us. And he gets away the devil. God is so big because he made the whole entire world. And how would he do that if, if he wasn't so big? Those are all great answers, kids. God definitely has to be big in order to make and run the whole universe. Yeah, and if I know he's big enough to rule the whole universe, I guess he's big enough to help me with any problem I might have, like my homework or bullies at school or like even healing, getting healing, or have my protection. That's right, Corey. When God told Job how big he was and how he made everything in the universe, Job said back to God, I know you can do everything. That's in Job 42, verse 2. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do for you. Hey, Rosie. I think it's time to learn a memory verse. Hey, Natalia, can you give us today's memory verse? Today's memory verse is 2 Chronicles 2, 6. 
not even the highest heavens can contain God. Thanks, Natalia! And remember, kids, God is big enough to make the universe and everything in it. And he's also big enough to do anything you need him to, like help you with homework, or conquer a fear, or help you obey your parents. God is ready to give you his power whenever you ask him for it. So, Mason, I hope that answers your question today. How big is God? Well, he's bigger than anything. And that answers your question. So, see you all later, guys. Bye-bye. Bye, Corey. Bye, Rosie. Thank you for answering my question. Bye. God is so big and he's so small. He's big enough to rule the universe. Small enough to live in my heart. All right, kids, thank you for sharing that with us. That's awesome. Listen, just a quick note for those of you that are uh, emailing, e-transferring money into our church for your giving. We want to thank you for sowing into Gateway Victory Church. This is good soil. You might even be been watching for a while, or maybe this is even your first time, and you're like, man, I'd like to do that. I'd like to be a part of this and support these guys and what they're doing. If it's ministering to you, then go ahead and uh, take a second and pray and think about that. Uh, instructions on your screen at the end of the broadcast for it. So thank you for doing that. You know, I want to encourage you right here in a time of maybe incredible change for you. Uh, you know, culture is changing, economies are changing. Maybe the changes have reached you and your world and uh, the way that money comes to you. Listen, let's believe God together for his wisdom and for his grace to be upon us. He has everything to do with our personal finances, right? And it's not to get things from us. It's to get blessing to us and so that we are able to give freely and able to fulfill our destiny here on the earth. So recognize that God has a big part in this. And of course, it helps to, to, helps to sow your faith when you sow your finances into a church and you give regularly into a church. So thanks again for um, considering that. Let's go ahead and pray. I want to take a moment and pray over our finances and over our jobs and over our income. We've seen God do some amazing miracles um, in our finances, you know, as a church and as businesses in the church. And, and he's been so faithful to provide for us throughout all this time of change over this last little while. So let's go ahead and pray and believe God with me when I pray that uh, God is going to make a difference in your personal finances. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we come before you right now, many of us uh, needing work or needing jobs or needing different jobs or better jobs or needing other sources of income. God, many of us come to you even just asking you for wisdom and for, for direction to know what to do with the, with the blessing and the things that you've given us. And so, Father, here today, as a church, as, as families in it, as individuals in it, as businesses represented here, God, we come before you, the source of all things. We come before you, the source of every good thing. And Father, we just thank you for your wisdom, for your guidance and your direction. If you need that today, go ahead and thank him. Say, thank you, Lord, for your guidance, for your wisdom, and for your direction. Say, I receive it now, Father, in Jesus' name. And God, we believe you for supernatural finances. We believe you, God, for supernatural things that you open doors where um, things seem to be shut and closed down. God, I thank you that you open doors. God, I thank you in Jesus' name that you cause supernatural income to come to people that need it, that have need of it right now. In Jesus' name, that God, you come and you are our provider. We thank you for your word that says that you're able to make all grace abound towards us so that we having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. God, we thank you for this promise in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Well, praise God, thank you for your giving. We're going to go in our Bibles to the next part of a series that we've been in for a number of weeks now on how to approach God and uh, how to come before him and the fact that we can have confidence when we come before God. And so I want you to go in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. If you've been with us in uh, the weeks prior here or, you know, maybe over the last little while, a little bit, you'll know that we've been in Hebrews chapter 10. And so go there. Let's start there. We'll springboard from here. And we are going to see what else the Spirit of the Lord has to say to us out of Hebrews chapter 10. You know, all Scripture, the Bible says of itself that Scripture is written for our instruction and for our training in righteousness. And so we ask God every time that we preach and every time we pray, go ahead and ask God. We're going to ask Him right now that He would help us with this, that God would speak to us using His Word. We ask you for that now, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. 
Hebrews 10, 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. This is the verse that we've been um, triggering the series off of right here, that you and I can come before God with a boldness and with a confidence in our heart. This is different than coming before God, you know, asking him if you can approach him, you know, or coming to God and uh, not with much confidence that he's there or, or really with any awareness in your own life that he's there. But here we get to come before God with a confidence. Know that this is the standard between you and God, that you get to approach him with confidence like this. And it's getting to God, not just from a distance, not so that you have to yell from a far off place and hope that, hope that he hears you. This is right before God in the holiest place, in the place that God is, you can stand right there by faith. You just open up your heart and you say, God, I come before you now. And you can know with confidence, oh, thank God, that you are right in the holiest place. It says you can come before God entering the holiest place by the blood of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus. This, this reminds us that our access to God, and you, we, have, we have access to God, that this access is not based on the good things that we've done or based on how much we know the Bible or how much we go to church or watch online um, you know, broadcasts of services. This is not about that. This is by the blood of Jesus. It's not by what you've done or haven't done. It's by the blood of Jesus, meaning that Jesus' sacrifice has made it possible for you and I to enter God's presence. Because listen, there is no sin there is, there is no bad thing that can enter God's presence, but because of the blood of Jesus, he has made his righteousness your righteousness, and you can go before God. This is what we've been looking at. So you can go before God with confidence, confidence that it's not you that gets you there anyway. It's not your um, actions or not lack of actions in a certain area that's getting you before God. You get to go before God because of the blood of Jesus. Say, thank God for the blood of Jesus. That's how you and I approach God. And it says that we have access by a new and living way in verse 20, by a new and living way that he consecrated th for us through the veil that his, his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God. He's talking about Jesus himself. He says in verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. This is the confidence. Right? You can see it in the language here. I am fully assured. I am fully assured in this position before God that I get to go before God as a son or daughter of the king. I get to approach the king. Everything that the king has, I have in my life. Everything that is his is mine in Jesus' name. So you can get to approach him. And it says this, it says, let us draw near. And one of the things that we've said here with this, let us draw near, is this, is that that this means that we could not draw near, that we could be distant, that we could be, we could spend days or weeks or months kind of drifting away from, you know, or even a whole season of our lives. We could be distant from, from God. And, and if you feel that there is any distance between you and God, I encourage you today by the blood of Jesus, certainly not because you or I have earned it, but by the blood of Jesus, we can draw near to God. Aren't you grateful for that? That in the midst of a crisis, in the midst of a time when, when uh, things seem to be unraveling around you, you can be one that draws near to God. Let us draw near to God with a true heart, in full assurance of faith. God wants us to have a full assurance of faith. And, uh, you know, full means 100%. 100% faith that I know that God accepts me, that I know that God loves me, that I know whose I am in God's eyes. I know that I belong to him and I know that every good thing that he has, he is willing and ready to reward my faith with and to provide for me with. This is full assurance. And this means 100%, not a half-baked assurance. Not a 50% assurance or a 20% assurance, but you and I get to have a full assurance before God. And we're going to talk about that. It says having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. And I know we've mentioned some of these things here, but just to catch up, maybe you've, maybe you've forgotten or you haven't kind of been tracking with these messages. Maybe this is the first time you've heard us talk about this. But it says that our hearts can be sprinkled or can be cleansed from an evil conscience. And what this means is that the, the original language says this, the nagging notions, the persistent notions 
here in this case, that you and I aren't adequate, that you and I can't approach God, that there are things between me and God, or between you and God, that, that God just can't get around and he can't look around, and, and they're, 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 they're barriers between you and God. It says these nagging notions, you're going to have your heart cleansed from that so that you have, and like I said, full assurance, 100% assurance of faith before God. And it says in verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, without doubting, without going from one thing to another. Let us hold it fast. Let us know whose we are and know that the prayers that we have prayed to God will be answered in Jesus' name because we have that confidence. We have a full assurance of faith. We can hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. And then here it is right here. For he who promised is faithful. Not because we're any, you know, anything, anything special or <laughs> special because we're his kids, but it's not because of us. It's because of him, because God is faithful who has promised. And the way that you and I participate, this is, this is 2 Peter 1, 3, the way that you and I participate in the things of heaven, says in that verse, in, in the way that we participate in the divine nature is by believing the promises that he has made to us. We believe it. We choose to believe what God has spoken. We choose to believe what God has said. And we hold that confession of our hope without wavering, with 100% assurance before God, with confidence approaching him by the blood of Jesus. Because he who promised is faithful. Why don't you say that out loud with me? Say it out loud with me. He who promised is faithful. Say it again. He who promised is faithful. Now, praise God. Praise God for that. Now, I want to I show you something out of, the, out of the book of Romans. If you can go to Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8 in your Bibles, you can um, go on your screen or just in your, in your um, Bible. Go to Romans chapter 8. I want to show you something here today. It says that you and I can have our minds cleansed. We can have our, 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 our thinking cleansed from the nagging notions that say that, that this can't happen for us or that we can't approach God like this, or that God just doesn't answer, doesn't seem to answer our prayers when we go before him. We can, go bef we can get cleansed from those nagging notions. I want you to see this here in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Are you in? If you believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you believe that, that God raised Jesus from the dead, if you believe that in your life, the Bible says that you are in Christ, right? That, that, you're, that, that you don't stand just by yourself, but you are in Christ. When God looks at you, he sees Jesus. He sees the righteousness of Jesus. That's what it means when you confess with your mouth, when you have faith in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and you confess it with your mouth, you become a believer. You become someone, and, and that, is, that has been many of us for a long time, and maybe that's fairly new to you, but when you cross that line and you say, Jesus, I choose to believe. Just come, Jesus, come and live in my heart. When you do that, you become a believer, and it says that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This word condemnation, it means to feel less than. It means to be, be, be guilty. It means to feel some sort of separation between you and God because maybe you are not worthy. All unworthiness goes when you realize that you are in Christ Jesus. Now, I got to take a second to say this. You have a spiritual enemy and the enemy of your soul, the enemy will try to come around you. The enemy will try to come and make you feel like you don't belong. The enemy will come to you, make you feel like you don't belong, like you are not worthy to stand before God. But you are worthy. The Bible says that if you are in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Praise God for that. It says there's now no condemnation for you, for you are in Christ Jesus. Then it goes on, it says this. It says, who do not walk according to the flesh, but walk according to the Spirit. This doesn't mean that there's condemnation on you if you have a bad day, if you just start walking in the flesh, if you do some things that are fleshly or that are carnal. No, this is not what it's talking about. It's not saying that condemnation is on you if you're not having a perfect day, but if you're having a perfect day, then 
condemnation isn't on you. What it's saying here is that because you are in Christ, there is no condemnation. For someone who is in Christ does not walk after the flesh. You don't, you follow after the spirit. You walk after the spirit of God. Can you see that there? So it's not saying condemnation comes and goes on your life, so you better be perfect so there's no condemnation. It is saying because you are in Christ and because you are of the Spirit of God, you have been born again by the Spirit of God. Because of that, you therefore have no condemnation on you and on yourself, okay? And so it says that the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, in verse 2, has made you free from the law of sin and death. Don't you just love that? The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, verse four, that the righteous requirement of the law would be fully met in us Again, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those of us that are born again, those of us that have the Spirit of God on the inside of us. It says the righteous requirement of the law is met in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The, imagine this, that, that the righteous requirement of the law is fully met. In other words, you are fully equipped to enter the throne room of God, to be in the very presence of God. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus. Because the righteous requirement of the law has been fully met in you. I wanted to show you this because you look around down verse 15. Let's go to verse 15 of Romans 8. It says, For you did not receive the spirit of God, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, right? The fear that you might not measure up, the fear that you're not good enough, the fear that God is upset with you. You did not receive a spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. You received the spirit of adoption, which means that you belong, which means that you're one of God's kids, which means that you have right and access in his place. It says here that you did not receive the spirit of fear, but a spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself bears witness with your spirit, with our spirit, that you are children of God. The Spirit of God himself, watch this, it's God's Spirit inside your spirit will bear witness. In other words, it will convince you. It will testify to the truth that you are in Christ Jesus. And, and here's what the Spirit of God speaks to you. Here's what he witnesses to you, that you are one of God's kids. That if you just get quiet and just kind of open up your heart and say, God, do I belong to you? then your spirit that knows that you belong to God, the core of who you are, your spirit will agree. Of course, yes, you belong to God. And then the Holy Ghost on the inside of you will speak to your spirit to say, yes, you believe. Yes, it's true. You are a child of God. And here's what the spirit convinces you of. He says, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. Now listen, a couple of things in this verse here. We're heirs of God, and the Spirit of God convinces us of this fact, that we are heirs of God. You know, an heir gets an inheritance. It gets an inheritance, an inheritance. you know, like a, different than a slave that works out in the, out in the field and, and just does the master's bidding and, and you know, gets looked after, but, but certainly not an inheritance. No, a son or a daughter of God has an inheritance among the sons and daughters of God. Look at, look at this, what this says. The, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. In other words, you and I, have everything that Christ has before God. Talking about the access before God, talking about the answers to our prayers, talking about those things that God wants to accomplish in our lives, just as God the Father accomplished them in Jesus' life. God the Father will accomplish them in our lives as his kids, as sons and daughters of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And then it says, if indeed we suffer with him. And this if indeed we suffer with him, it, it's talking about the, the pushing against the evil 
in the, in the world around us. You know, the world is full of values that go against the values of the kingdom of heaven. The, the world is full, the Bible says, of the curse of sin and the brokenness and the pain and the sorrow and the, 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 the anguish that's in even creation because of sin. The Bible talks about that. And, and, and Jesus, when he was on the earth, he had to push against that. He had to push against the unbelief. He had to push against the evil in the culture around him in his day. He had to push against it. He had to push against it. He had to fight for the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ to be established in his own life. And so do you and so do I here on the earth. If we suffer with him, we will all also be glorified together with him. Praise God for that. Listen, it is the Holy Spirit's job to convince you and to convince me. It is the Spirit of God's job. So we come before him and we say, Holy Spirit, show me. Holy Spirit, make this real to me. Holy Spirit, I want to know. It is the Spirit's job. See, the Spirit himself will bear witness with your spirit in verse 16 that you are indeed a child of God. Now jump down to verse 38 here while we're in this chapter. Jump down here to verse 38 where it says, For I am persuaded. Some of you might know this verse. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful verse that, that says that nothing can separate us from the presence of God, from the love of God. No matter what trial, no matter what um, we face down here on the earth, nothing can separate us from the love of God. But here, you, here we go. This, this whole verse is prefaced by this statement, for I am persuaded. This persuasion, this word it kind of signifies to me that there was this process involved. It goes from, God, you really love me? God, are you sure that you love me? God, my heart's open to you. If, if you're really there and if you want anything to do with me, if, if it's true that Jesus died for my sin and for my wrongdoing and to, 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 to take care of my life, like if that's true, God, I'm interested do you really love me? Do you really care about me? It goes from there to I am fully persuaded that nothing can separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, my Lord. I want to I present to you today that you can be persuaded of this very fact, of this very truth. That the Spirit of God can work with your spirit and your mind and it can become aware. <laughs> you can become more and more aware of the presence and of the glory and of the love of God for you. And not a love of God that says, you know what, your life sucks, but I love you anyway. But the love of God that says, I'm here with you in the battle and in the fight. I'm here because I love you and I'm with you to see to it that you have what you need. Everything that you need for life and for godliness. This, this love of God is active and it's involved in our lives. Just like you love your kids and just like, you know, a, a parent loves their children and wants to be there for them, wants to provide for them, wants to help them, wants to help them mature and to grow. So is the love of God for you and for me. Come on, let's be persuaded. It is the function, it is the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives to convince us. Are you ready to be convinced? Are you ready over this next little while? If you ask the Lord by the Spirit of God, He will convince you. And I mean that for you, whether you are barely recognizing or understanding these things about the Holy Spirit, or if you've been following Him for decades, maybe you're somewhere in between. Tell you what, it is the Spirit of God that will convince you and draw you to your next level of persuasion of these things. It is because you hold fast to the confession of your hope without wavering that you will see him who promised is faithful. Praise God. Let's go ahead and pray together right now. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you and we ask you right now, Holy Spirit, that you would persuade us even more. No matter where we're starting this prayer today, God, I pray that you would just come by your spirit and persuade us. As I pray, you open your heart. 
open your heart to, to draw yourself closer in to the presence of God and to ask the spirit of the Lord to persuade you of this very thing. And so God, here we are today asking you, Holy Spirit, come, persuade us, convince us, show us, witness, bear witness, testify to our spirit, to our soul, to our thinking that, that we are who you say that we are, that you are a good father to us and that nothing can separate us from your love and that we can come before you with full confidence, full assurance of faith. Thank you for it today, Father. Thank you that you do that by your spirit in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said, amen. All right, amen. Be blessed and have a wonderful rest of your week. Details on the calendar on our website for things that are happening um, all week long. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you.